The exhibit is called Changing Keys, Keyboard Instruments in America, 1700 to 1830. And what it does is uh, trace the history of keyboard instruments over that period. The purpose of the exhibit was to show the development of keyboard instruments over that time frame, included most importantly the transition from harpsichord to piano, you know, but also many other smaller transitions uh, in style, musical resources, and so forth. The earliest instrument we have in the exhibit is a 1700 spinet made in London by Stephen Keane. It was a new fashion to make uh, and play spinets. By the time he made our instrument, spinets were the keyboard instrument of choice in England and America. We have another instrument made in about 1740, 1745 uh, by a Swiss immigrant working in London named John Zopfa. And uh, he made an instrument that ended up in the beginning in Williamsburg, uh, belonging to, the, uh, to a family that moved then to Charlotte County, Virginia, where the instrument stayed up until 1976, when the family gave it to Colonial Williamsburg. The original instrument is in pretty poor condition. Uh, it's missing some keys, so we were able to keep it untouched in its original form by then making a reproduction. And we get a lot of use out of the reproduction. We're able to leave the original instrument uh, untouched. Spinets were the keyboard instrument of choice in the early part of the 18th century. But uh, closer to the middle of the century, harpsichords, full-size harpsichords, uh, became more common. Uh, one of the most prolific makers in the historic period in any country was uh, Jacob Kirkman, who was based in London. We have three harpsichords made by Jacob Kirkman. One of them is in the exhibit, a two-manual harpsichord. It was made in 1762. Spinets uh, have only one string per note, and there's really nothing you can do with the machinery to change the sound. Harpsichords introduce uh, multiple sets of strings. So you can change the sound you have by adding or subtracting the number of stops. The first public performance on a piano in America was in 1771 in Boston. Later the same year, there was a performance right here in Williamsburg at the Raleigh Tavern. The instrument that would have been used for that program is very much like this Zumpa square piano. We're very fortunate to have in our collection a piano made by John Zumpa from the very first year of his production of pianos, uh, 1766. And we're very fortunate also that it's never been restored, which means it has all the original uh, cloth and leather and strings, uh, all those parts that get replaced in a restoration. So we were able to get an idea of what it sounded like by making a very accurate reproduction. We have two pianos side by side in the exhibit that are from around 1810. The first is made in London by uh, George Detmer. Right next to it is a piano by John Geib. He was a German immigrant piano maker working in London where he invented a piano action mechanical design uh, that was so important that it uh, eventually came to be used in virtually all square pianos in America and in England. He moved to America at the end of the 1700s. We included in the exhibit a number of models of the mechanical actions of these different instruments. One of the models shows the action that was invented by John Geib in 1786 that really revolutionized piano design for 50 years uh, following. The grand piano was extremely rare in the beginning. Uh, and by the end of the 1700s, you begin to see some grand pianos in the homes of the very most wealthy people and for public performances. Uh, we have a piano made in London by John Broadwood uh, in uh, 1806. And it's a wonderful grand piano with a great tone. Uh, we put it in playing condition some years ago and we've made recordings of it. It's a very nice instrument. 
We also have an action uh, that shows grand piano action like you would have seen in the Broadwood piano. And it's an interesting contrast to the modern grand piano action, which is very much more complex. We are very fortunate to have a strong collection of keyboard instruments that we've been uh, collecting since the 1930s. And when you line them all up, they really tell a fairly complete story about the development of keyboard instruments in America from uh, the time that you would have first started seeing them, around 1700, uh, up, until, um, up until the end of our period, uh, 1830.